Hi everyone, I'm Mark Harrison and this is A History of Rome. Last week we heard how the debt crisis of the poor was continuing to cause tensions between the people and the ruling patrician class, and how these tensions had led to the Senate to offer compromise in the face of a looming military threat, only to go back on their promises time and again. We also heard how the plebeians had eventually removed themselves from the city, forcing the Senate to negotiate. And finally, how these negotiations led to the creation of one of the most important magistracies in Roman history, the Tribune of the Plebs. Let's continue. Following the ending of the plebeian secession and the establishment of the Tribunate, tensions remained high in Rome. Many patricians were unhappy with the new political reality, whilst the people in general were still wary of the Senate keeping its word, it having failed to do so on previous occasions. Added to this was the pressure of Rome's traditional foes looking to exploit any weakness arising from the city's political instability. The first conflict of the campaigning season came when the Romans found themselves facing the Volsci, under Consul Postumus Caminus Aruncus, they met a Volscan force from Antium. Caminus' men won an easy victory, defeating their enemy in the field and capturing the towns of Langula and Polusca in the process. Going further, they then laid siege to another Volscian force that was encamped in the town of Corioli. Rome's position, though, was not as secure as it seemed. The army from Antium, despite having been beaten, had not been destroyed. They had regrouped, and now they attacked the besieging army. Seeing the potential for a breakout, the Volscians within Corioli now sallied out, and thus the Romans were hit from two sides. The general on watch for the defenders was a man named Gaius Marcius. He quickly assessed the situation and gathered a small force which he led in the direction of those that had sallied out from the town. The attack was so fearsome that the defenders were forced all the way back to the city gates. Marcius now pushed his troops even harder and as a result they forced a way through those gates and into the town. And as they spread out the soldiers began torching the nearest buildings and before long the defence had completely fallen apart. Out of options the people surrendered. The Volscian force outside after witnessing the town's capture, broke and fled. In later recognition of his efforts, Gaius Marcius would take the cognomen Coriolanus. Now, at this juncture, the Latins, witnessing once more the power of the Roman army, looked to end any lingering antagonism between them and to re-establish peaceful cooperation through a formal treaty. Rome was happy to oblige and the Fuedus Cassanium or the Treaty of Cassius was signed by Spurius Cassius Viscalinus on behalf of Rome and the 30 cities of the Latin League. The treaty was far-reaching. It called for the mutual defence of the signatories to any threat from Italic tribes. Leadership of the army was to be shared, but in reality it would be primarily Roman commanders that would lead it into battle. And further, it provided for the establishment of joint colonies in captured territory. There was even a section that established a recognition of mutual private rights between citizens of the Latin towns and of those of Rome. There was now a growing interaction and interdependence between Roman and Latin societies of the time. The signing of the treaty with the Latins meant that Rome by 492 BC was relatively quiet on the military front. Even the Volsci had fallen back into their own territory. Though this was less likely to do with Roman power or treaties with the Latins than the fact that the lands of the Volsci had suffered from pestilence that year. This pestilence for their enemies was somewhat convenient for Rome which was at that time actually beginning to suffer from the effects of famine. The famine was a knock-on effect from the events of the recent conflict between the orders, as during the crisis, with the plebeians focusing on their fight for rights, few crops had been planted. The Senate did, however, manage to avert a major incident through the timely purchase of grain from Etruria. This purchase, though, was but a temporary solution. By the next year there were again food shortages, and so to relieve the suffering of the people, the Senate agreed to further imports of grain this time from the island of Sicily. But in typical senatorial fashion, 
once it had the grain, it could not agree on its distribution. It was Rome's most recent hero, Gaius Marcius Coriolanus, who was the problem. He advocated holding on to the grain until the plebeians had agreed to forfeit the rights they had gained through the secession. In other words, an end to the tribunate. But he had miscalculated. For the vast majority of the Senate, this was too harsh a measure. And they also knew that an angry populace was in no mood for any more patrician backsliding. In the end, Coriolanus was undone by the very magistracy that he sought to undo. For the tribunes put him on trial. Despite their internal differences though, the ruling class still saw Coriolanus as one of their own and fought vigorously for an acquittal. Failing that, at the very least, a lenient sentence. But in the end, Coriolanus did himself no favours by refusing to accept the legitimacy of the proceedings and by choosing not to attend the trial. The result was a conviction and he was forced to flee into exile. Embittered, he sought revenge by offering his services to his old enemy, the Volsci. Now with such a high-ranking and competent general now allied to him, the Volscian leader Attius Tullus Aufidius saw an opportunity to strike a successful blow in his war against Rome. And so over the next couple of years the Volsci undertook a campaign in which they retook many lands that they had lost to the Romans and struck at numerous Roman towns and colonies. But whereas Tullus was happy taking revenge against Romans in general, Coriolanus Ayer was focused on one particular group, the Plebeians. In retribution for their representative's role in his downfall, he did all he could to make sure that the Volscian army attacked only the lands and properties of the Plebeians and left intact those of the Patricians. By 488 BC, the situation for Rome had become difficult. Weakened by famine and with a population that was still simmering with discontent, the city found itself vulnerable. With the Volscians now encamped just five miles from the walls, the consuls for that year, Spurius Nortius Rutilus and Sextus Furius Medellinus Fusus, looked to ready the people for a hard pressed defence. But the people had had enough. They wanted peace and implored the Senate so. The Senate realised that without the people on board there would be no defence. So to negotiate peace, they twice sent ambassadors to the enemy camp, but twice they were refused. On a third occasion, priests were sent in the hope that they would have more gravitas in the eyes of the Volsci. But the result was the same. Coriolanus and Tullus were determined, it seemed, to bring down the city. It was then when hopes for a settlement seemed to have faded and Rome looked to be in a fight for survival, that representatives stepped forth that were likely unexpected by both parties. Leaving the safety of the city and making her way to the Volscian camp went Vittoria, none other than the mother of Coriolanus, and with her went Volumnia, Coriolanus' wife, and with her their two sons. And for good measure they were also joined by the matrons of Rome. This was an embassy that could not be refused. Standing before Coriolanus, the entourage begged him to spare the city and its people. In the face of such a plea, and because of by whom it had been delivered, Coriolanus' anger was finally tempered. He relented, and in agreement with Tullus, the Volscian army struck camp and moved away from the city of Rome. Now at this point, Coriolanus drops out of the historical record and his fate is unknown. But of the women who had secured peace that day, they were honoured through the construction and dedication of a new temple to the goddess Fortuna. Over the next year or so, Rome's food crisis eased. It also began to recover militarily. It held its own against continual conflict with the Volsci and against a new threat from the Herniki a tribe which bordered the Latins and the Volsci. The threat from the Herniki did not last long though, and by 486 BC it had been neutralised through the signing of a treaty. Full stomachs and successful campaigns, however, did not mean that Rome was at peace with itself, for the bear pit of Roman politics continued to take its toll. Spurius Cassius Viscalinus was on his third consulship in 486 BC. 
Believing himself a popular politician, he decided to mark his term in office by attempting to redistribute land to plebeians and Latin allies through a new agrarian law. But moves like this were ever unpopular with the Senate in general, and this move proved to be no exception. The pushback was led by his co-consul, Proculus Virginius Tricostus Rutilus, who was vehemently opposed to the idea. Without support, the law was swiftly defeated. But the fact that it had been proposed was not forgotten. The following year, the Senate took its revenge. Now out of office and no longer immune from prosecution, Cassius was accused and convicted of trying to foster the support of the people in an attempt to set himself up as king. He was condemned to death for high treason and was thrown from the Tarpeian rock. Over the next couple of years, the fight against the Volsci and the Equi died down somewhat. But by 483 BC, the threat to Rome markedly increased when reading the current lack of military activity by the Romans to be a sign that they were weakening, an old foe again took up arms and joined the fight, the Etruscan city of V. V's timing looked good, as the fact was that Rome was distracted. Relations between the orders were still very strained, and when the Senate was not quarrelling with the people, it was divided itself between squabbling factions. And as their external enemies grew in number, a new issue arose that kept their attention on internal matters. The Vestal Virgins were an integral part of Rome and Roman life. Of their many duties, the most important was to keep alive the fire of Vesta as a symbol of the eternity of Rome. With the position came many privileges, but also personal sacrifices. One of which was that Vestals were prohibited from marriage and must remain a virgin throughout their 30 years of service. For a Vestal to lose her virginity would be to anger the goddess and to put the safety of the city at risk. It was a serious offence, which the Vestal Oppia now found herself accused of. Following a series of portents, and after the advice of soothsayers, the young woman had been accused of a breach of chastity. Her punishment was to be entombed alive, with a small light and a little food and water to last a few days, after which she would die a lingering and unpleasant death. The day of her transport through the city to the tomb was a major state occasion, and all came out to witness the unfortunate woman's final journey. Despite its domestic issues, Rome found that it could not wholly ignore the threat from outside. The Vientes and the Equi were becoming a problem. The former was now rampaging through Roman territory with impunity, causing severe damage, whilst the latter had begun a siege of the Latin town of Ortona. The Romans were unable to deal with both threats simultaneously, however, as recruitment was an issue because the plebeians were being encouraged by Tribune Spurius Licinius to refuse military service in support of a new agrarian law that he was trying to pass. Although support for the law was minimal, even encountering opposition from fellow Tribunes, recruitment had been affected. Forced to make a choice, the consul Ciso Fabius Vibulanus looked to relieve Ortona. Unfortunately for Ciso, the current state of public discontent had filtered its way into the ranks of the army. Having won the battle, the infantry then refused to pursue the fleeing enemy, which had to be dealt with by the cavalry alone. With discontent making discipline difficult, having achieved victory, Ciso elected to return to Rome, leaving the Vientes to continue their pillaging of the lands to the north of the city. And so, the 480s BC came towards its end, with the Romans having come through a series of military crises more or less intact, yet having never quite managed to defeat their enemies in their entirety. Their ability to deal effectively with external threats had been hampered by ongoing conflict between the patricians and the plebeians, and disagreements within the ranks of the patricians themselves. If Rome were to survive, it needed to get its house in order. If you like our work, please help by subscribing, pressing the bell button and commenting. And we'll see you next time on A History of Rome.